Welcome to the Explore Words Discover Worlds podcast, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. In this episode, Tolkien biographer John Garth and Professor Diane Perkis hold a fascinating discussion exploring the bonds between J.R.R. R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and the impact they had on each other's work. Recorded live at the 2023 Bradford Literature Festival, this episode discusses the close friendships of two literary giants of the 20th century. Hello and welcome everyone to this session on Tolkien and Lewis, friendship um, that redefined fantasy. I'm called Alaric, I work at Leeds University uh, where mostly I do medieval studies but medievalists kind of keep find them, finding themselves drawn into talking about people like J.R.R. Tolkien mm. and C.S. Lewis. Um, and I'm with uh, my colleagues Diane um, and John. So Diane is at Oxford University where she's Professor of English Literature um, and also at Keeble College, Oxford. Um, and I know Diane, ooh, sorry, oh, okay, all right, we're okay. Uh, I, I know Diane uh, best through her work about fairies, so I suppose it was about 2000, was it? Yeah, 2000, that book, yeah. yeah. Troublesome Things, uh, A History of Fairies and Fairy Stories. Uh, and that book is a really uh, scholarly, but also very readable and accessible um, you know, tour of what's going on in, uh, with fairies in the mostly English literary tradition. Um, but uh, Diane has been very busy since 2000 <laughs> uh, and has all sorts of exciting books to her name. And most recently uh, published uh, just last year, English Food, A People's History. Um, and although the title doesn't particularly suggest it, I understand there are several references to Narnia uh, in this book, uh, and witches and fantasy and so forth. So uh, look out for uh, English Food. Meanwhile, John uh, is, well, I suppose best known as a Tolkien expert yeah. um, from a, a great many uh, perspectives, though he's also associated with Corpus Christi College, Oxford. Um, and uh, a, a while ago now, you published uh, the book Tolkien and the Great War, so mm -hmm. that was a, a you know, really interesting biography, giving us a lot of insights into how the experience of the First World War sort of shaped Tolkien as a person and as a writer. And then more recently, John published The Worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, of which I forgot to bring my copy, but it's uh, a sumptuously illustrated uh, uh, volume <coughs> taking us into Tolkien's inspirations and uh, literary work. So we are well placed for a really interesting conversation about creativity and authorship and friendship or even antagonism, frenem frenemyship yeah. um, <laughs> between uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to our actual speakers. But first, I'd just be quite interested if you could put up your hand if you've read a book by J.R.R. Tolkien. Films don't count. <laughs> okay, so most people or almost everyone. And then C.S. Lewis, a book by C.S. Lewis? Oh, oh, again, almost everyone. Okay, so Good. I think we've got similar levels of acquaintance with these two mm -hmm. writers. Mm -hmm. um, Diane, would you just like to say a tiny bit about, before you kind of present some of your recent th thinking, just a little bit about how you've got interested in Tolkien and Lewis? Um, I assume you mean, as, as a reader first, um, the Narnia books were absolutely foundational to me as a child. They were the books I loved best in the world. I read them over and over again. And every time I came to a wardrobe, I would optimistically try the door, get inside, tap on the back, you know, hoping for a miracle. Um, I came to The Lord of the Rings at the age of 11 on a holiday in the Barrier Reef. Um, and really, I didn't see very much of the reef because I was so absorbed in what I was reading. And I have lovely memories of lying on a coral sand blinding white beach, reading about orcs and balrogs and hobbits, and then I went on to read that book about 25 times. But I didn't get interested in it academically until I started on a new project about the writing process and how you go from a sheet of blank paper to a fully formed universe like Narnia or Middle Earth. 
I mean, how is that even possible when we really think about it? And yet it's what all writers do, actually. Do you just take from your own life? Do you make it up from other books you've read? How does it even work? So that's when I went back to Lewis and Tolkien, this time as an academic, rather than as the, the in absolutely entranced child reader I had been. And that's where I started to discover just how complex their writing processes were. Oh, thanks. And John, what brought you into Tolkien and Lewis? The really very, very similar story. Uh, so, so I was a, an avid reader of, of comics when I was mm -hmm. seven. Um, and I was an able reader at school, but I just hadn't met the books that, that I wanted to read until mm -hmm. uh, my, my school teacher read us The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and Prince Caspian. Mm -hmm. um, and I, was I really was transported. I mean, I literally remember sitting there on the floor weeping <laughs> at the at the return of Aslan, right? oh, wow. um, me too. Yeah, and that led on to Tolkien at Lord of the Rings at the age of nine. Actually, mm. that. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see, I see where we're going. Um, and and I, you know, that kind of swallowed me whole. Um, and and both of these things oh. helped to shape my personality, I guess, my interests. Yeah. Um, and, and my yeah, my interest in, in creativity. I wanted to be like Tolkien in particular. Yeah. I wanted to be a professor of English at Oxford. It <laughs> uh, wasn't good enough. I became a journalist. But my um, work on Tolkien specifically has been very much uh, the, the same point that Diane's made. I, I, I want to try to crack open what it is that um, what what lies behind this magical act of creativity. Yeah. Um, it's not pulling rabbits out of hats, you know. There's, no. there's something behind it all, and, and often yeah. uh, it's as fascinating as the stories themselves. Yes. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So, thanks very much. I think that's got got us orientated. I'll be interested if there are any advances on nine, <laughs> for, <laughs> for age at which you read Lord of the Rings. Um, Should we give a special prize for <laughs> the youngest? <laughs> yeah. um, but Diane, uh, I'm conscious uh. then that you've been doing this uh, kind of coalface research on how cre creativity works, how writers operate, and that's led you to think a bit more deeply about what C.S. Lewis was getting up to. Mm. So would you like to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, thanks. I, I have a story to tell, and it's not altogether a happy story, so be warned. This is a story about a phenomenon known as misattribution, where you think you've created something, but actually it's a memory of somebody else's work. And this, I think, is this, uh, a term that we can use about the Chronicles of Narnia in relation to a book that I'm betting no one here has read because it's never been published. It's called The Wood That Time Forgot, and it was written by Lewis's very great friend and first biographer, Roger Lanson and Green, whom some of you may be familiar with because he did some wonderful retellings of mythology. Now, this book um, exists in manuscript, but one chapter of it's been published, and that's what I'm basing my findings on. Green showed it to Lewis at a time when Lewis was determined to write a children's book, but hadn't been able to make any progress with it. He'd written, had one try at it, and the Inklings had told him it was dreadful. Oh. And then does he was stuck. Does everyone know who the Inklings are? Yeah, so well said, so Alex. Some nodding, but some head shaking. So do you want to... A, a collective uh, noun for the group of Lewis's friends that included J.R.R. Tolkien, but many other writers and academics as well. Um, we don't know exactly who rubbished Lewis's children's book, um, but he was quite stuck. Um, and then he read Lancel and Green's manuscript. And in reading the single published chapter of it myself, I noted no fewer than 10 strong parallels in 12 pages with the Chronicles of Narnia and with Lewis's manuscript continuation, his first try at a sequel to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And therefore, I'd like to share these with you. First, the children don't tell one another about their other world experiences initially. Secondly, there's an area in the wood called Witchwood, near an area called the Wolfwood. These are all features of the Lancel and Green novel, just to be clear. Um, one child suggests a let's pretend game to the others and is rebuffed when they arrive in the strange universe. There's a tunnel that parallels a tunnel you probably won't be familiar with, a tunnel with a river flowing through it in Lewis's first try at a sequel to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The phrase, it is very quiet, um, which is used repeatedly in The Magician's Nephew about the wood between the worlds, 
a term which itself is sonically quite close to the wood that time forgot. Um, the children keep getting lost in the wood and eventually have to follow a stream which has high cliff banks like the rush in Prince Caspian. Let's take off our shoes and stockings and paddle, cry the children in Roger Lancel and Green's novel, just as the Pevensies do in Prince Caspian. Um, and again, that's immediately in both books on arrival in the imaginary world, the magical world. Both groups of children say it at the same moment in the story. When lost in the dark wood in Roger Lancel and Green's fiction, the children follow a heavenly sunbeam to safety, just as the Dawn Treader does when escaping from the island of bad dreams. So that's 11 overlaps in just a 12-page chapter. I should say immediately I haven't read the whole novel because it's in Wheaton College, Illinois. And there's more to say if people are interested at a later stage that Green himself comments on, because obviously Green knew his own book best. The sadness of this is that Green, who was obviously a perfect gentleman, seems to have been willing to sacrifice his own interests to forwarding Lewis's work as writer. Though he does comment, very sadly, I will never be able to publish the wood that time forgot because everyone would think it was dependent on the Chronicles of Narnia. So that's my story. And I want to be very clear, I am not saying that Lewis plagiarized Green's work. I am not saying that he sat down and transcribed Jean's, Green's manuscript. I think what happened was that when he finally sat down to compose his own novels, what he thought of as images of his creation that kept popping up in his mind actually came from Green's book. And that's happened to very many other writers. Happy to tell you more stories about that if people are interested. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks. So that gives us quite a rich sense of how um, C.S. Lewis is hanging out with this little circle of writers called the Inklings, hearing them sharing their ideas and their work, and finds himself influenced by that. And I guess in due course we'll come on to how Tolkien and Lewis did or didn't influence each other. And I'm conscious, John, that you've thought a lot about Tolkien and how far he kind of borrows literary material from other people or doesn't, and how original or derivative a writer he is. So I don't know if you want to kind of share some thoughts from a Tolkien point of view. Yeah, uh, so, so as we, we were chatting before the event, Tolkien started out his efforts to become a, a writer by impersonating the prose and verse styles of William Morris, um, famous maker of Liberty's wall, wallpaper, uh, but also great socialist and uh, translator or co co-teller of uh, Icelandic sagas and, and uh, author of many sort of pioneering romances, as he called them, really sort of adventure stories, in the mode of, um, in the mode that, that later authors like Lewis in the Narnia books um, followed. So, and Tolkien was quite clear, I am doing this, he, he took a story from the Finnish Kalevala, uh, collect, a, a verse cycle of uh, mythology and legends. Um, I'm taking this story from Finnish legend and I'm retelling it in the style of William Morris. And if you read the first version of Tolkien's Silmarillion, the Book of Lost Tales, it's drenched in Morrisian style. It, it, it reads, in, it's very antiquarian in its style. Um, later on, Tolkien was criticised for using um, a, a very mannered style of English, particularly in The Lord of the Rings in certain sequences of the Lord of the Rings, but that's far more controlled and more t Tolkien's own creation uh, than, than how he started out. So that's, that's all a matter of, a matter of style. Um, I think it's... Oh, that's, so here's, here's one example from Tolkien of, of perhaps the same... Um, what was the word you used? Misappropriation? M m misattribution. Mi misattribution, <laughs> okay. That's what you call it, just in case you want to use it in <laughs> conversation. I think you may be misattributing my idea to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Tolkien says in one of his published letters, um, I based uh, the Wags episode in The Hobbit on... Uh, oh, no, no, I'm not, not going to remember the source. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Um, on, on, a, on a book that he'd read when he was a kid. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, 
and you read that book, uh, it's uh, it may come to me by the end if we're lucky. Um, <laughs> was it Longfellow or something? No, like not Longfellow. No. no, Longfellow was Lewis, really. No, yeah. Okay. Um, it's there on, on Project Gutenberg, so if I do come up with a name, you can see it for yourself. Um, where there's an encounter with, you know, demonic wolves. And it's not like the uh, episode in The Hobbit, actually, but it's so much like the episode in The Lord of the Rings that you would almost say, oh, gosh, Tolkien just didn't know what to write here and decided to, oh, let's just grab that scene there. He tells it much better than the original author. But see how well you framed that. See, I think that's what happened to Lewis as well. It's that moment where you don't know what to write and you just grab something. That's the moment when misattribution is very likely to occur. And all writers have that experience, even if they're incredibly creative, as both Lewis and Tolkien were. You still have these moments where you're stuck and you don't know what comes next in your story. Tolkien had them a lot and actually got paused frequently in writing Lord of the Rings. Lewis was more efficient and faster, but only when he got going, he had a very long blank before th between deciding to write a children's book and actually being able to do so. And I think it's that moment where you're most likely to find yourself unintentionally misattributing. I'd also say, John, do you agree with this? I'd also say that Morris's plots influenced Tolkien. The, the, the narrative, there's a wonderful lost Morris work called... Um, the world beyond the world that was read by lots of officers in the First World War, and it's this dark, terrible journey to discover the water of life. And it's very reminiscent. When I first read it, what I thought of immediately was Frodo and, ja and Sam in, crossing in the Dead Marshes. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and in Mordor, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this desolation and sort of mo moral desolation that goes on with it. Mm. Right? Um, and there's another, there's another great example, um, the roots of the mountains, mm. where there are um, two allied nations. Um, one comes under attack from evil forces from the east, um, and the other one rides a perilous journey um, mm -hmm. to, to, to aid them, to break the siege. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, even, there's, a, there's a woman there who dresses in, in male armor. Um, and is, you know, she rides into battle. People don't know who she is. Uh, yeah, when they find yeah. out who she is, her, her I forget, um, affianced or her brother or whatever, uh, rides, rides across the battlefield shouting, death, death, death. Wow, yeah, okay. It's so yeah. similar. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but, you know, D just, just for anyone who hasn't read Lord of the Rings, right. this is similar to... Rohan and Gondor <laughs> and Eowyn, the story of Eowyn, okay. who rides yeah. into battle dressed as a man. Um, and, and her brother, Ian Mira, is the one who yeah. rides into battle after his king's been killed with this sort of berserker-like death wish, yeah. screaming death, 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 yeah. meaning he's seeking out his own death. And, and it's also a little bit based on the Battle of Maldon, sure. yeah, yeah. which is an actual like fifth cen um, eighth century Anglo-Saxon poem that Tolkien knew very well. Um, so, I mean, he, in a way, it's, it's actually typical of writers to start by imitating, as Tolkien did, because people don't, aren't born with their own style. Style is something that grows gradually um, on a person as a writer. I mean, we could give kind of canonical examples, like if you look at Shakespeare's early plays, they're not really stylistically very much like his later, later plays. It takes people a while to write themselves into their own voice. And so it's fairly standard, and it used to be educational practice to begin by imitating people you thought were great which is what I think Tolkien's doing with Morris. But I distinguish that quite sharply from what I think Lewis is doing. Lewis, I think, just had a very sticky mind. He had the kind of mind that picks up unconsidered trifles. He had a brilliant memory for quotations and would lecture without notes for exactly 50 minutes with a lecture plan from memory. Um, I think that's exactly the kind of person who misattributes most often because they've got so many words and ideas and images and pictures buzzing around in their heads the whole time. It becomes almost impossible to decide which ones were theirs. And uh, Lewis wrote quite a lot about um, the creative process and, and mm. the pr process of inspiration, didn't he? Okay. Uh, and he, he would say, um, you know, it began, it began with a picture, yeah. Narnia, he, or a dream about a lion, uh, yeah. things like that. Um, but he also uh, said that you should never ask a writer, how they come up with their stories, because yeah. they don't know. Yes. 
He exactly. says, you know, they spend their time concentrating on the, on the thing they're creating. Well, yeah, um, they're, they're completely absorbed in it. And, and the mechanisms that they're using are sort of behind them. They're not mm. the focus of their attention. So they, they simply won't be able to help you with that. And I found that an incredibly useful um, uh, quote when thinking about Tolkien. Now you've said what you say about Lewis, I start to wonder whether this is actually the Lewis um, in denial. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I kind of wonder that too. Um, uh, my hot tip from my work on the writing process is never believe anything that a writer says about their own writing process. It's nearly always immediately disprovable by looking at their manuscript <laughs> archives. Authors, and I am one, are the most horrible liars in creation. <laughs> and the very standard lie that we all tell is, yes, I've been working on it all weekend and it should be ready by Tuesday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we get used to that kind of lie. I mean, I, I could tell you about the amazing lies that Ernest Hemingway told both about his life and also relentlessly to his publisher. No, I'm on it, honestly. Right. No, it won't be, I won't be a minute. Um, it's just normal, but in a way. Tolkien kept that one up yeah, for, 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 for like 12 years yeah. with The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, you know? absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm on the verge of finishing it, really. <laughs> um, and, and I've just made this amazing copy of a medieval manuscript to go in it. You won't mind publishing that, will you? <laughs> yeah, he literally yeah. made The Book of Mazabal, which is, if you've seen either the movie or read the book, it's the book that Gandalf reads that Balin's dwarven expedition to Moria leave behind. The book that ends with They Are Coming about the orcs. Wasn't enough for Tolkien to write that. Perhaps you'd like to comment on this, John. Instead, he had to actually physically make a book of Mazabul of his own with runes and also with burn marks and burn stab scars. Marks. Yeah, <laughs> and stab marks and bloodstains. But, this, but that actually, this is another example of, um, well, I think in this case, a, a different kind of influence. So Tolkien's, I think, think here, consciously working within a tradition, Absolutely. which is totally. uh, one, one very key predecessor for Tolkien was um, uh, Henry Ryder Haggard's novel She, um, about a, 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 an immortal woman uh, who, who um, lives under a, a ruined city in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and that novel was, at the start of the book, there's a frontispiece that has um, a a drawing of a, a piece of pottery with, mm -hmm. with Greek on it, classical Greek. And Haggard got a friend of his who was a classicist to, to write the text, had it made up by an artist. Uh, and this is the, the fragment in the story. It doesn't exist, of course. It's a, it's a fiction. It's a f the fragment in the story that leads the adventurers to this lost mm -hmm. city to, to find this, this uh, immortal woman, Aisha. Um, and Tolkien's very much, I think, working in that mode. He wants, he wants physical artifacts to give his wholly fictional and ridiculous story um, a, an anchor in seeming reality. Yeah, and there's another source for the Book of Mazabal, too, and that is the actual manuscript work that Tolkien did. Let's not forget that he was an academic and a medievalist. Um, and he worked on medieval manuscripts. And I don't know if you've, you know about the Cotton Fire. It's one of those horrifying library fires where we lose we don't even know what. Two of the key texts on which Tolkien worked, Gawain and the Green Knight, and even more importantly, Beowulf, the old English epic, just luckily survived the Cotton Fire, but both of the manuscripts were scorched by the fire. So when he thinks about the Book of Mazabal in his fiction, he's also drawing on his research, which is also what lots of academics tend to do. You tend to find a way to work your research into everything. <laughs> you are that annoying person at a conference where you may be talking about Milton, but can we just talk about fairies for a minute? <laughs> yeah, because somehow it reminds me of something that I'm preoccupied with. And, and this is where it's relevant to note that all the inklings were academics. So a big part of what was feeding their creative process was constant rethinkings, re-readings, re-teachings, re-lecturings, re-studyings, which is another thing, I suspect, that leads to more misattribution. Mm. Can I interrupt for a moment? Yeah. Is that okay? I've got to just remember the two points I was about to make, but go on. No, no, you make your two points, you sure? and then I'm going to move the discussion into Tolkien and Lewis and their relationship sure, a bit more sure, specifically. Sure. Go for it. So... so uh, uh, I forgot one of the points immediately. Uh, oh no, 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 I haven't. Okay, so I think I think that Tolkien's creativity and his academic work really were in dialogue together. Yeah. So he used um, 
you know, the creation of a medieval world and its languages, um, both to study how languages work um, and to consider what it would be like to live inside Anglo-Saxon England, for example, by re reconstructing it as Rohan, um, where, you know, bits from Beowulf are made real, as it were, um, the, 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 the Hall of Medusel in particular. Um, but the other point, the, so, so a further influence, I think, on Tolkien's Book of Mazarbul comes from experience, in fact. So when mm -hmm. I first started researching Tolkien and the Great War, um, I went to what's now the National Archive at Kew and looked at his officer service record from the First World War, but also at the war diary of his battalion. I ended up looking at quite a few different war diaries. Mm -hmm. And they aren't burnt and stab marked, mm -hmm. but they are written in the trenches. Yeah. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 this, so this was a real lived experience. And I think Tolkien's lived experience does come into The Lord of the Rings. Uh, uh, take, for example, in Moria. Um, so they are travelling through these labyrinthine tunnels, right? Mm -hmm. They've got a roof over their heads, but not unlike travelling through the trenches. Mm -hmm. um, they are bedding down in places where, you know, the enemy might suddenly surge around the corner mm -hmm. and attempt to stab them to death. And this was, you know, very true. Yeah. In, the tr in the front line trenches, you are, if you're in a, uh, an officer's dugout, who's to know whether the enemy, the Germans, are going to suddenly mm -hmm. burst through the door, come down the stairs, bayonets at the ready, you know. Um, there's the, the doom, doom, doom of the drums in the deep, which to my mind um, uh, evokes, you know, the sound of artillery, yeah. especially from underground. Mm -hmm. I think Tolkien used his art, uh, his writing, to, um, to channel process um, and, and, and deal with some of the, you know, the horrors and fears and terrors that lingered from those experiences. Yeah, and he knew it too, because I was mentioning earlier <laughs> his letters to his publisher. There's a, an, a, a terrible, really upsetting surviving letter from Tolkien to his publisher. It's saying that he completely lost control of his writing process. I'm summarizing very briefly here, because he, he says he kept wanting to write about fairy, but whatever he did, what he calls the darkness of the Silmarillion material, the darkness of the earlier material keeps breaking into the story mm -hmm. and taking it over. And if you've ever read any of Tolkien's works, if you're, you're among those members of the audience, you'll know that that's true. That from the very beginning in The Hobbit, there are these sort of intrusions of darkness mm -hmm. into what seems like a lovely Trumpton-like pastoral landscape or a moment of song and enjoyment. Um, where you're suddenly reminded of an awful surrounding truth. Now, that's partly anglo saxonness but it's not all anglo saxonness oh, no. An awful lot of it is Tolkien's own personal experience. Yeah. And this is where I'm just going to mention that one of the things that he and C.S. Lewis, or Jack Lewis, as all his friends called him, had in common, was that they both lost parents at a crucial age. Um, Lewis's f uh, mother died when he was nine years old. And I mean, that's a terrible time to lose a mother. And he was never very close to his father. Tolkien also lost his father at the age of two, and then his mother to diabetes when he was only 12. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think cemented their friendship was that experience of prior loss, yeah. that sense of being alone in the world and needing to find other people to build a sort of alternative family with. This is also said about Lennon and McCartney, by the way. Yeah, you know. absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so before we go down the <laughs> Lennon and McCartney yeah, we don't rabbit hole, um, <laughs> so uh, we, we've got a really rich sense so far, and I should say, I should say actually, by the way, just to make sure that uh, uh, we keep things roughly on track, we'll, we'll talk for another twenty minutes or so. Then we'll have fifteen minutes or so in which you guys can ask questions. So if you're sitting there thinking, "Oh no, what was that Ryder Haggard novel, <laughs> or whatever." Um, you know, hang on to those questions and uh, be, be ready to ask them in about 20 minutes. But um, so we've got this really rich sense then of these two writers um, who are both um, acquainted with, e with each other at some point in their lives because they're part of the Inklings, this little kind of writer's circle at Oxford. They're both academics and so they think about creative writing 
as a, partly as a research process, um, and they, they sort of think about it from quite an academic point of view. They both become major English fantasy writers, so they're clearly in each other's orbits in lots of ways. Um, but I wonder if we could just think a bit more specifically about the Tolkien-Lewis friendship, or frenemyship as it might be. And I, I'd really like to get a clearer sense myself of when they first either meet or come into each other's circles, um, how far were they already formed as writers before their friendship started? Can I take this? Oh, yeah, if you'd like to, yeah. Um, so they, they were quite different ages. Lewis was um, born in what, 98? 1898. Tolkien was born in 1892. Um, therefore, their, their experiences that, uh, with, with the First World War in particular, they, they, Tolkien was already, he, he completed his degree when he went into, uh, in, into the army. Lewis uh, took a very short course and then went in. Um, they actually met in 1925 at an English faculty afternoon tea um, in Oxford. Uh, oh, th th so that would be just after Tolkien moved to Oxford from Leeds. From Leeds, that's right. Uh, yeah. Where he used to work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and there's a, there's a reference to this meeting in Lewis's diaries in which he says, I, I, I had a conversation with uh, Tolkien afterwards, uh, a smooth, pale, fluent chap. Nothing wrong with him that a slap or two wouldn't mend. <laughs> um, uh, and that doesn't sound awfully promising, but that's kind of Lewis all over. He's very pugilistic, um, but also very kind of uh, very very kind of helpful. I, his aim is to help people, even if it's by violence <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of them some in sort. Lewis like mold is yeah, what that well, tends to maybe, mean. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe. But you know, Tolkien was a strong personality, um, and, and Lewis had to, you know, came to respect that. I think he, I think Lewis exaggerated it, but I'll, I'll come to that shortly. Um, Tolkien basically uh, inveigled Lewis into a closer uh, companionship by getting him to come along to a, a, a reading group uh, that read the Icelandic sagas in, in their orig original language uh, in the late 1920s. Um, and Lewis loved Norse myths. So although this was not his subject, um, his, his specialism in English teaching was uh, the Renaissance um, and uh, uh, Tolkien was, was Anglo-Saxon and Middle English, so pre-Renaissance. Um, but that was, that was a connecting point. Gradually, around the two of them, uh, particularly with some of Lewis's older friends, uh, this, this group, the Inklings, formed. Um, the height of their friendship was uh, from about 1929, when Tolkien finally showed Lewis... Uh, these epic poems he'd been writing, uh, set in the world of the Silmarillion, and Lewis loved them and was tremendously supportive. He became Tolkien's primary reader or listener. Um, and there's a lovely little uh, uh, anecdote from a, an undergraduate student of Lewis's saying that ar around 1936, Tolkien would pop into Lewis's college, Magdalen, uh, to help out in evening sessions reading, old in reading Beowulf, right, which was Tolkien's topic, not Lewis's. Um, and this undergraduate writes, they were like two young bear cubs at times, just quipping with each other, making puns, uh, having competitions, blowing smoke rings and things like that. You know, So it's a really lovely picture of these two, you know, kind of two grown men finding a kind of innocence together. Yeah, um, well which, which, which then I think fell apart because, um, because of just changes of personnel that came uh, as a result of the, uh, the Second World War uh, and Lewis fickly moving on to other friends. Um, That's one way of uh, describing it. I think there's, there's other things going on there too. And yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm right about this, but wasn't it also the case that before they set up the Coal Biters Norse group, they actually fell out massively um, in a very Oxford way about how the Oxford syllabus should work. And, and Tolkien wanted it to be language-based, and Lewis thought it should be literature-based, as it mostly is now. But actually, it was Tolkien who won Lewis over. Yes, that's true. And I think yeah. that tells us something very important about the relations between the two men, that Tolkien, despite being the less approachable and less extrovert of the two men, was usually the dominant influence in the friendship. Lewis, on the other hand, quite liked being influenced. 
and where it all fell apart, as you said, was actually, I think, at least initially, the advent of a, a, a third term, Charles Williams, um, who, uh, and I said, I mean, Lewis was, loved being influenced. He was a pushover for influence. He actually <laughs> liked influence. Yeah, he didn't dismiss it. He didn't dis feel dismayed by it. And when Charles Williams, anyone here read a Charles Williams book? Quick poll. Hmm? Hurrah! <laughs> That's un pretty unusual, as you will gather if you look around the room. Um, so Williams had a very toxic effect on Lewis's developing style. And I don't know if anyone here has read that Hideous Strength or any of the others of the Lewis Space Trilogy. I mean, I, th I think it's not out of line to say that most people would say that Hideous Strength is the weakest of that trilogy and also one of the weakest of Lewis's fictions. And that's at least in part because it's ended up being intersectional with Williams's Imaginarium, which doesn't actually go at all with the work that Lewis was doing on the Space Trilogy based on his association with Tolkien. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being a bit of a chameleon on a tartan background, trying to be all things to all men, which doubtless was how Lewis felt in the situation that was developing. This, and this is a trilogy that, that Lewis began as, as a part of a pact with Tolkien to Correct. write science fiction. Yeah. So Tolkien's was never published. Um, it was going to be time travel, and his Lewis's life, was yeah. going to be space travel. Yeah. Um, this is how Tolkien invented the land of Numenor, which is the, the focus of that... Um, amazingly poor Amazon uh, <laughs> <laughs> dramatization. How long have you got the, while we dissect the, it? The, the, <laughs> the rings of power. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so Tolkien wrote about people traveling through time to ancient Atlantis, which he renamed Numenor. Um, and Lewis wrote about people traveling to Mars initially, then to Venus. And, th and then, third volume, uh, bizarrely enough, it all takes place on Earth and it's got Arthurian stuff going on in the background and all kinds of, you know, very, very strange. Um, Lots uh, of violence, too, because, I mean, unfortunately, Williams had this slight sadistic bent that found its way into Lewis's imagination as well, where uh, I guess maybe relating back to the wish to, to smack Tolkien, um, there was a sort of uh, an uncomfortable way in which um, Williams' theology was dependent on the idea of pain and lots of punishment, and that finds its way very right. unfortunately, I think, into Lewis's imagination with unpleasant results, and I think I'm going to say. And the central character, Ransom, yeah. who was quite clearly originally influenced or inspired by Tolkien, he's a yeah. philologist yes, who goes quite. to Mars, yeah. Um, and there are there, there's a hilarious scene where uh, Ransom in Out of the Silent Planet meets his first alien yeah. who speaks to him. And Lewis writes, uh, you know, you would have to be a philologist yourself to understand how astonishing this was to Ransom. Yeah. Uh, immediately there flitted through his mind uh, the, the, the project of a, uh, a Martian mm. grammar <laughs> and this, uh, you know, a dictionary of blah, 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 and whatever. Mm. And Lewis knew that Tolkien had hidden away, you know, you know his grammars of Elvish, yeah. his morphologies, yeah. his etymologies, yeah. his yeah. lexicons. Um, uh, and it's, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very friendly portrait of Tolkien. In that hideous sta strength, the third volume, the volume that's influenced by Williams, Ransom is unrecognisable. Yeah. He's completely changed as He's a character. He's this weird blonde messiah lying on yeah. a sofa yeah. and constantly in pain because that was what Williams thought was important. Right. Um, so it wouldn't be unfair to say that Tolkien, not at all unfairly, felt that something had been taken away from their friendship and handed to somebody else. I mean, the other thing I was just going to mention about Lewis's sticky mind in the space trilogy is people might recall that in Perilandra, the second volume of the Space Trilogy, the Adam and Eve couple are named Tor and Tinidral, mm -hmm. which uh, Tolkien's daughter Priscilla was certain was lifted from Tolkien's first age couple, Tuor and Idril, mm -hmm. and it is sonically very close. Moreover, the land of Numenor is referenced and actually misspelled yeah. in that hideous yeah. strength, and th that might have been a friendly allusion that was meant to bring Tolkien on board with the book. It's also worth adding that Tolkien really appreciated Rams Ransom as a philologist, and actually said on reading the first of the Space Trilogy that he thought Lewis had got the languages right, <laughs> which is very much not his view of the Chronicles of Narnia, a point to which we can turn if you like. Uh, well, I'm conscious that in around eight minutes or so. We'll see if, you've got, if you guys have got questions. Religion has started to kind of come mm. into the discussion, so mm. that might be interesting too. Yeah. But um, w would it be nice to talk about the Chronicles of Narnia and how mm. they do or don't relate to this kind of friendship between Tolkien and Lewis? Well, um, Tolkien really disliked them. 
and is on record as saying, it won't do. <laughs> Have you read Jack's fairy story, it won't do? Um, and most Tolkien fans initially interpreted that as simply meaning, well, it's not very well worked out as a mythology, which it certainly isn't. You've got Father Christmas in a world with no actual Christ, um, bringing along tea where no one knows where it can possibly have come from. Um, it, it's um, been described on the internet, I think, quite aptly as a kind of roulette wheel that Lewis spun you know, to find a different mythological figure. But the full Tolkien quotation is actually slightly more interesting than I just made it sound, where he says... Nymphs in their ways and a girl having tea with a fawn, does he know, does he really know what he's writing about? I think Tolkien there was picking up on a sexual subtext that to him was funny, almost, but also ludicrous. I mean, when fawns kidnap little girls, they don't want to give them sardines on toast, no. actually. <laughs> That's not a big part of their ambitions. Moreover, nymphs in their ways, it's almost like, um, it almost echoes the title of earlier sort of sex manuals from the 18th century. And I think Tolkien felt that Lewis was naively and in a way stupidly ignoring the connotations that would be obvious to anyone with a reasonable knowledge of classical literature um, and that it was almost embarrassing that he'd written this story and, and not realized what he was saying. So I think that goes a bit deeper, in a way, into Tolkien's reservations about Narnia, and also ties Narnia back in, I'm afraid, with the Roger Lanson Green Book, which wasn't a children's book, and which contains a much more she-like figure, right. a much more Ayesha-like figure, who's a seductress, um, from whom the children in the book have to be rescued and redeemed, a sort of proto-white witch figure, but much more sexual even than that. I think Tolkien was balking at that aspect of Lewis's imagination, which is precisely the part that later intersected with Williams. And Tolkien's own project as a mythologist was always to, to try to go back to how the stories met, the stories we, we have inherited through sort of fragmentary literature and so on, how they might have been, uh, how they might have been told in oral tradition before writing began, uh, what, what events might have inspired them if the world had had a mythological past. Yes. Um, so I think he would have seen Lewis's, uh, you know, Satyrs and Nymphs as being a kind of Victorianized, sanitized mm. yeah. version of, of something more, more deep and truthful. But, there, but there's another aspect to the Lewis Lancelin Green um, thing, which where Tolkien plays a part. So mm. as, as I recall it, um, Lewis went to Tolkien with uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and showed it to him and Tolkien absolutely shredded it. Yeah. And Lewis yeah. was so upset that he went away to Roger Lancelin Green yeah. who said, no, no, this is good, you must publish. But by this time, the scenario that you've described must already have happened. It and happened. this is where the gentlemanly yeah. Roger Lancelin Green came through as a sort of sacrificial victim. But he was he not... Um, a PhD student of yes, he Lewis's. Was. Yeah, you always plagiarise from your PhD students. This is well understood. And it's kind of <laughs> horrifying. But yeah, he was. And, and I think probably didn't feel in a position to right. call Lewis out on right. it. That would be my take on what you're describing. Yeah. 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 No, the, the, the wonderful thing about Lancel and Green is he ended up sacrificing his interests in a way that I hazard no writer would nowadays to what he saw as the overall project of the Chronicles of Narnia. It would be all and over Twitter. Yeah, and he became, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he became Lewis's top beta reader and actually honed all the Chronicles of Narnia knowing that every single one of them was borrowing from his novel. Wow. Yeah, and I think that was a, an exceptional act of friendship. We're here to talk about friendship. Uh, to me, that is... I could never do that. I think that's an unbelievably gracious and gentlemanly action um, and, and goes well above and beyond what anyone has any right to expect from a friend. Or a PhD student. Actually, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, this still happens and it's often misattribution again. I mean, in yeah. some cases of student plagiarism, it, a misattribution, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still part of writing and writing life to try and notice yourself doing this. The thing is that Green seems never to have told Lewis, though I recently came to some evidence that he did speak to other writers about his situation, not altogether enthusiastically. Um, so I'm not yet fully at liberty to talk about that, but yeah. Um, he never made a public fuss. 
He could have made a public fuss. He could have derailed the Chronicles of Narnia right at the beginning. But he chose not to, for whatever reason. So, so I'm also inclined to think that one of the reasons Tolkien disliked Narnia is because he, he Tolkien felt that he had kind of reinvented the genre of, mm. of having this, sort of this medieval mm. style world uh, in which magical things mm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that Lewis was, was lazily picking bits and bobs yeah. out of that mm. Um, mm. for his own purposes. Nonetheless, um, and it's, this, is, this is very sad, when you look at the, the lives as a whole, yeah. When Lewis died in 1963, um, so he was, as I say, six years younger than Tolkien, but predeceased him by ten years, yeah. um, Tolkien was absolutely heart-stricken. Yeah. Um, and there's yeah. a sense of, you know, a, a debt unpaid, because mm -hmm. Tolkien hmm. quite clearly, quite truthfully said, I would never have published anything if it weren't for Lewis's constant, yeah. constant yeah. support and, and, and interest. Yeah, I mean, that, the thing is, this friendship had lots of lumps and bumps. But you're really, you're really right about this, John. It, it led to some fantastic works, and we'd all be poorer without them. Whenever you pick into how stuff happens, it's usually pretty dirty and ugly. Right. And all writing is a horrible kind of process of shutting your family away and <laughs> trying to drive them away. And Charles Dickens would insist on having lunch with his family, but they weren't allowed to talk to him. Um, because it might disturb his concentration. Um, I mean, all writing is like that. If you're not like that to begin with, you become like that uh, because you're writing. But despite those caveats, we would all be so much worse off without mm. these fantastic works, however much blood and sweat went into them. So at this point, um, we've spoken for about 45 minutes in a very warm room. <laughs> and uh, it might be nice to give you guys the opportunity to put any questions to our speakers that have been brewing for you, whether that's about Tolkien or Lewis or how they relate to each other or, or how PhD writers students work. and <laughs> professors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how to relate to your supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> how um, to tell your supervisor, I know it's my idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so would anyone like to uh, offer any... Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, we've got, got a question right at the front. And a microphone is about to come round to you for the benefit of people at the back of this very kind of acoustically challenging room. Greenhouse. Yeah. yeah. This isn't a question. Have I got it on? Yeah. Right. It, it's just want to say, make a tribute to both of those fantastic writers mm -hmm. and all the others that came mm -hmm. before and after, because it now allows me to talk on FaceTime with my grandson, who is 11 mm -hmm. and 200 miles away, and we go off into amazing, fantastical worlds, which I don't think... I would have been able to do, and he's followed that tradition now with all the marvellous writings and films and animes that are around, and I'd just like to say a huge thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hurrah, absolutely yeah. well said, yes. and you're so right. Um, for what it's worth, um, I came to Oxford at the age of 23 to do a doctorate. My supervisor was a man of honour, um, and um, I on my first day in Oxford, met a person who was as passionate about Tolkien and Lewis and medieval literature because of them as I am. We've been married for 36 years, to cut a long story short. <laughs> the, yeah, it, it's, it's true that there were some divisions over these works, but you're right, they've also been such a force of unity. Mm. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, the person whose hand is up has read the third of the Lewis Space Trilogy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> an important figure. I've, I've read all three of them. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and another late Lewis's. Yeah. I, was, I was really into them. I'd like, I'm interested in the effect they may have had on each other in terms of language and literature. Mm. Because, um, as you said, Lewis was into literature and Tolkien was into language. Mm. I did language at Leeds. Mm. Lovely. <laughs> Good school. And it was his department. Mm. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah. Um, they obviously, if you, said, you mentioned earlier that it was something that they talked to each other and that there were tensions about. Mm. And did, lang what was, did, did Tolkien press anything out of language onto Lewis and vice versa? I think I'm going to leave you to, to do that one. Uh, well, I, I have actually one, the, the, the one problem with biography and, and knowing the facts about these things. So we, we have information from Tolkien's letters. We have some information from Lewis's letters. But the fact that they lived in the same town and worked for the same university means that there are almost no letters between yeah. them. Yeah. So we're not party to their discussions. 
So there's a lot of guesswork has to go, a lot mm. of inference. Um, but I think it's reasonable to uh, imagine that Tolkien, one of the reasons Tolkien approved of Lewis's language work in uh, Out of the Silent Planet is because he helped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably right. And, and I think, you know, it's really, it's, it, it's great, actually. Uh, Out of the Silent Planet as a, as a book about language is, is marvellous. So this is pretty early in the um, development of science fiction yeah. as a genre. Yeah. Right? It, it was a pu- they were pioneering writers. Lewis pioneered um, a, an element of science fiction. And in general, in science fiction in those days, you would meet aliens and they would speak perfect American English. Yeah. Right, you know. yeah. um, but this isn't the case in Out of the Silent Planet. No. Um, and there's a marvellous scene where... So, so it's, a, it's a moral story um, about actually human moral degradation. It's, mm. it, it, the hero is kidnapped and taken to Mars by two men who want to exploit Mars... Uh, for its resources, its physical, material resources. Critique of colonialism. Yeah. And there's a point at the end where uh, Ransom, the philologist, who's the only one of the three who can speak the Martian language by now, has to translate the concepts of these two Earthmen <laughs> into the language of the Martians. Mm-hmm. And it's almost impossible for him to do because the Martians don't, for example, have a word for lying. Right, um, a, a, and it's this phenomenally uh, circumlocutionary, <laughs> locutionary um, description of, of of what they're trying to say. But but in doing so, it reveals the moral vacuity mm. of their intentions, of the of the yeah. Earth Men's intentions. It's it's yeah. great, great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Hello, thanks for such a wonderful talk. I'm a big fan of the writing of Owen, Owen Barfield. Oh, great. And uh, I wanted to bring Barfield in as a, as a, you know, as a great friend as he was of mm. theirs. And what, what you thought was the influence of Barfield on their writing. I know, I know that when he wrote Poetic Diction... Um, I, don't and, know and I don't know who Owen Barfield is, it's so... A, a question, uh, yeah, no trouble. Um, so, Owen Barfield... A big influ- I've never heard of this person. A big influence on Lewis and Tolkien. Yes, and yes. more Di- Lewis than Tolkien. And Diane is oh, going to tell us again. who this guy is. <laughs> and um, only in the broadest general terms, you're probably better placed to instruct the audience than I am. If you're a huge fan, but, but that's, my, that's my main sense is oh, sorry, that he here. was a huge influence on Lewis's um, conversion to Christianity. That that it was Barfield. It, in a way, even more than Tolkien, who persuaded Lewis. There's a point where Lewis, there's a surviving letter where Lewis says something along the lines of, oh no, all my closest friends are Christians. So, and, so and we, we're pushing probably need to step one step back yeah. and do C.S. Lewis as an atheist, C.S. Lewis sure. converting to Christianity. Sorry, yes, of course, sorry. And then slotting yeah. in Owen Barfield. <laughs> yeah, Lewis, Lewis began his career as an Oxford Don as a proud atheist um, and was converted back to Christianity, having been brought up as a Christian, by the combined efforts of two of his friends in particular. One was Lo- Owen Barfield and the other was J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, he always desc- Lewis described it as happening on a bus journey, where he got on the bus as an atheist and got off it as a Christian. But in actual fact, it's likely that the driver was a m- late-night conversation with Barfield and Tolkien where they were walking together in front of Lewis's rooms in Magdalen College. I actually had a room in that building when I started out at Oxford, high cotton. Um, And um, they were discussing the fact that Lewis could easily believe things if they were expressed in terms of mythology, but couldn't easily believe them if they were expressed in terms of doctrine. So he couldn't believe Christianity if it was boiled down to abstract principles and felt that its mythology was inadequate for his needs in comparison with his deeply loved Icelandic and Norse mythology. And Barfield, who was in many respects a comparative mythographer, because he was also a theosophist, managed to persuade Lewis that actually Christian mythology was compatible with and could even be seen as an expression of the beloved Norse, Greek and Roman myths that he liked. So that, that, as I understand it, was Barfield's role. And obviously, all of Lewis's writing comes from that moment. Um, if you've read any of his pre-Christian writing, it's not that great. Um, so it, it seems really clear that, in that sense, Barfield was absolutely decisive. Wow. 
do you have further views on this? Don't feel you have to. Um, well, as, as for Tolkien, um, so, so Barfield was an old friend of Lewis's, and Lewis, Lewis was basically a, a two-disciplined man. He was a philosopher as well as a, a, an English lit man. Um, and Barfield was a philosopher. Um, but he wrote this book, Poetic Diction, um, which argues that the language we now speak, um, I'm not sure if I can express this very clearly, um, makes a, a division between, it, it splits meaning from a, a sense of physical reality. So he argues that in the first place, when people talked about breath and spirit, they meant the same thing. Um, and they believed in a kind of um, holistic uh, wholeness of, of things like breath and spirit, and now we conceptually separate all of these things. Um, and I think you see some of that feeding into the Lord of the Rings, um, where, well, say in, in the scene in Lothlorien, where they visit the mound of Kerin Amroth, and um, Frodo sees the world around him as if it's been newly created um, in colors that are not strange, but he recognizes them for the first time uh, in their sort of primariness. Um, and it's yeah, so so I think th th there is there's definitely a, a Barfieldian influence on Tolkien. There's a book about it called Splintered Light by Verlin Flieger. Fascinating because I was going to ask, because I don't want to preempt the audience's questions, but I, I always connected that with Tolkien's Catholicism, because one argument um, about Lewis's conversion is that Tolkien passionately wanted Lewis to convert to Catholicism, but Lewis had been brought up as an Ulster Protestant. And the thing that was difficult for them as friends is that Ulster Protestants aren't particularly tolerant of Catholics and aren't brought up to be particularly tolerant of them. And Humphrey Carpenter has Lewis and his brother referring to Catholics as bog rats wow. and bog trotters. Um, I, I would associate Barfield's positions with something more like Eliot's disassociation of sensibility, the idea that when Dunn had a thought, he smelt it like a rose. Um, as opposed to the later idea, and I think that had a huge impact on Lewis's non-fiction, thinking particularly of the discarded image here. Ah, I'm sorry, just because I, it hadn't even occurred to me to wonder this. I knew that Tolkien was born in South Africa, yeah. so there's that uh, kind of colonial dimension to Tolkien's formation. Was L Lewis from Northern Ireland? Yes, born in Belfast. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And had a strong Belfast accent. If you listen to recordings of... Him. It's RP, but there's a definite Belfast sound. And, and saw himself all his life as, as a Northern Irish person. Oh, wow. And some of his mythology is Northern Irish, the giant. Okay, yeah, so that's a kind of classic example of me just integrating this guy into an image of Englishness, yeah. uh, when actually there's a much more kind of dynamic... Great idea, though, uh, that they're both post-colonial subjects, in a way. Hmm. That... that um, I'm Australian myself, and we were all encouraged in my childhood to think of ourselves as sort of English, but not quite. And, and I think that there might be an element of that in Belfast and a different element in Bloemfontein um, yeah. that, that might have also been a subtle bond between them. Mm. Thanks. Um, would anyone like to ask anything else? We've definitely got time for one more question, maybe two. So either everyone is like, no, just let me out of this hot room. <laughs> 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 Or, uh, or I can ask one last question. Oh, no, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I have, yes. Well, even uh, more unique <laughs> than the woman who's met, read that hideous track. Yeah, yeah, well, a couple of Charles uh, Williams books. Okay. But, um, I mean, it's partly a, a defence, I suppose, of Charles Williams, uh, but also of attribution. I mean, he, I mean, I, I mean I, throughout the talk, which I think was great, I mean, it, it was brilliant to hear it, um, the, the notion of attribution or borrowing uh, mm. is, to me, very, very important for writers. You mm. know, writers don't just write in isolation. Mm. Um, mm. And so you've got, obvi obviously, Lewis writing a lot from Norse mythology, from Greek mythology, from mythology throughout the ages. Um, mm -hmm. and, but also the contemporary um, attribution as well. I mean, I, I mean I, mm. it would be quite interesting to touch a bit more on the inklings. Mm. Um, people like Owen Barfield, um, mm. Charles Williams, who I would defend. I mean, I, I've read a one of his dissected novels, and the place of the lion, plus yeah. the um, there's an interesting biography of him came out about six, yeah. seven years ago. Gravel. I can't remember the author. Gravel, Gravel Lindop. Lindop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was a, a passionate defence of Charles Williams, yeah. and a, you know, kind of uh, hey, good on him. 
Um, but, uh, I mean, it's got an interesting, I suppose, in summary, how much of the attribution is, is actually really positive, because in terms of the, both, both from literature throughout the ages and from the inklings, how important was that to both Tolkien and Lewis? Me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It's a difficult question. But, um, um, well, Tolkien, I was pausing for thought. Maybe. Tolkien talks about. Um, it, it, he wrote a, a, a lecture called "On Fairy Stories," where mm. he talks about the tradition of fairy stories um, and and creativity. Um, and he, he says you shouldn't try to excavate the inspirations um, because what mm. matters is not. Uh, the primary ingredients, but what you do with them, yeah. what each particular tale or each version of a tale does with those yeah. ingredients. And I think that's really true. Um, and it, it's rather like, uh, well, there's, you could th think of all sorts of analogies, but let's say, um, uh, let's say dancers interpreting a particular piece of music or singers interpreting a particular piece of music, mm. they, can, they, they have to bring their own thing to it. They will be memorable more memorable the more they bring their own mm. style to bear upon mm. the original material. Mm. Um, uh, so I think that's true of Tolkien's Wargs episode, for example. Mm. Um, and, uh, mm. It's an improvement on the original, which I think was by someone called Crocker. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. Um, Fairy tales of gold. Uh, 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 and as Diane said earlier on, you don't form your tastes in isolation. In fact, I think your tastes are constantly reinforced or reconfigured by the context in which you in which you uh, exist as a cultural consumer mm -hmm. if you want to mm -hmm. put it that way um, you you see things you like you see things you mm -hmm. don't like um, some of that is is instinctive a lot of it's unconscious um, and you you move in that space yeah yeah I think that's right and I think it's it's worth saying as well that no writer can write without imagining an audience. Um, and, and for the Inklings, that was what was foundational for the group, that the Inklings became the imagined audience that enabled everybody to proceed to write because they had a, a belief, a faith, that they'd be understood, at least by some people. Um, and I, mean, I, I know exactly what you mean about Charles Williams. I, I personally really love both the greater Trumps and his surviving Arthurian poetry, but there's no doubt that it's significantly less well-known and less popular and more recherche, if we're honest. Um, so one of the things that therefore happens that can happen to anyone who writes is this difference between a very strong developed voice, which Williams had at that point, and Lewis's voice, which somehow was always prone to porousness, and some writers are just like that. They just find it easy to be overmastered by another writer. It's not because their talent's weaker, it's just the way they think and the way they become. And, and so I think while we might praise Williams' writing, I find it hard to praise the role that Williams' writing eventually played in Lewis's writing, which is a different matter. Mm. Can, I, can I, are we about to wrap up? We are about we to are, wrap up, yeah. you can have the last word. Yes, go. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the need for an audience. So, so my favorite anecdote about Tolkien demonstrates what a keen performer he was. And I think, I think from, mm. from what I've seen, you can trace this right back to uh, his earliest published writings, which were like in school magazines, yeah. um, where he's entertaining. He's very clearly entertaining an audience that has the same reference points mm. as him. And there are in jokes about mm -hmm. friends at school and things like yeah. that. But this story came from um, a historian, Hugh Brogan, um, mm -hmm. who's now passed away, uh, who was a fan of Tolkien um, as, a, as a boy um, and lived uh, in Cambridge. So he struck up a an epistolary friendship with Tolkien, his, his hero. Uh, and Tolkien visited the Brogan family home in Cambridge. Uh, and he, they had a marvellous staircase, mm. spiral staircase. Tolkien went to the top of it and fell down. He fell down, literally arms and legs flying, <laughs> and got to the bottom and stood up like that. <laughs> because it was his party trick. And he clearly, th this was a man in his 50s, right? So, right, about my age. I wouldn't dream <laughs> of doing anything like that. Tolkien was prepared to go to those kinds of lengths to entertain people. Yeah. And I think that's a, go a good yardstick for the kind of lengths he was prepared to go to as a writer to entertain people too. <laughs>
fascinating. I love that story. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to close things there. And uh, I've had a great time listening to Diane and John talking about all this fascinating stuff. And I would like it if you would join me in a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for listening. The 2024 Bradford Literature Festival starts on the 28th of June and runs for 10 days with a huge programme of events. From comedy to crime, music to memoirs. Head to bradfordlitfest.co.uk to book your tickets now.